Well, good morning. I'm glad to see a couple people here this morning, especially the youth over here dressed so fine. Um, a few of them who went to prom last night and are probably running on about two to three hours of sleep. So if they nod off, just give them grace. And I'm really happy to see uh, John back from being at seminary. The reason why I'm up here this week is that he's been in school almost all week. He finished up yesterday and drove st almost straight back to get back here um, yesterday evening to be here this morning, uh, something that he wouldn't have been able to have time to prepare this morning. And so I get the privilege and honor to come up here and speak to you this morning. This morning I'm going to start off with my points. That way you know where I'm going. And eventually, hopefully, we'll end on those points as well. We're going to start with point number one. Point number one, things aren't always as they seem. Point number two, the creation itself in our story today has submitted itself to the Lord. Are you submitted to the Lord? And point number three, there always have been haters and followers of Christ. This morning we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 28. Last week we talked about the deity of Christ in John chapter 1, and we're actually going to touch on that a little bit today as well. Pastor John asked me to choose a, a, a passage from the Passion Week, and he intends to preach on the Passion Week in the, in the upcoming Palm Sundays, or on the upcoming Palm Sundays in the future. He's going to take it over the next few years and go through that week itself on Palm Sunday. So what I decided to do was I decided to go to Luke chapter 28 where Jesus says, after Jesus had said this, he continued on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. Now he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives. He sent two of the disciples telling them, go to the village ahead of you. When you enter it, you will find a colt tied there that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say the Lord needs it. So those who were sent ahead found it exactly as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, the owners asked him, why are you untying that colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and Jesus got on it. As he rode along, they spread out their cloaks on the road. As he approached the road leading down from the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd and his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. But some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if they keep silent, the very stones will cry out. Many of you know I've had the privilege over this last year of working with the youth. And throughout the time, I've definitely enjoyed it. There's been a ton of people that have come along and helped me and definitely worked alongside in helping me work with the youth groups. Specifically, some of the people that are sitting here in this audience today. You see, that's not my full-time job. My full-time job, I actually carry a badge and a gun. I'm a deputy. For those of you guys who don't know, don't, don't know me, this is not what I do for a living. I enjoy doing this, but it's more of a passion than it is a job. You see, in law enforcement, I see a lot of different things. It's taken me in a lot of different places, a lot of different situations. Some interesting, some dangerous, mostly humorous. A lot of the things I see are really funny. A lot of times I can't laugh at those funny things. <laughs> Sometimes it's very, very difficult. And so the kids actually came up with this thing and they said, how is it that you can keep such a straight face? I said, I see funny things all the time and I cannot laugh. So they say, they call it cop face. <laughs> cop face. <laughs> all right. So during cop face when you know you sit there and you're looking and you're seeing things that are funny so a lot of times I hear the same things over and over and over again people come up to me and they say the same things one of the things I hear the most from people that are just trying to make jokes or things along those lines one of the things I hear a lot is I walk into a room and I hear the words I didn't do it 
That's what I hear. People say, I didn't do it. And so I've heard it so often that I started to think, man, what is the best comeback for this? What can I say to them that they're going to, you know, it's going to make them think for a little bit. So I sit there and I look at them. Typically they say, I didn't do it. And I'll say, well, that's not what your friends told me. <laughs> or I'll look at them and say, boy, I guess that FBI agent was wrong. <laughs> you know, things aren't always as they seem. That's another line that I hear in law enforcement. This is not how it looks. Or this is not how it seems. And we can take that a little bit from our text today. We're going to be looking at our text and this is say, it says, this is not how it seems. First, let's start off with a little background of this text. Jesus was traveling from Jericho where he had been and he had performed a miracle by healing a blind man. He interacts with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus repents and Jesus says, today salvation has come to this household because he too is a son of Abraham. For the, man, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. He then tells the story of ten minas. In order to truly understand what this passage in Luke says, we need to understand a little bit of the Jewish mindset. The passage that we'll be looking at today from Luke 28, which we just read, um, we have to understand the background of this text. In the story of the blind man, there's something that's very, very interesting. It's found at the end of chapter Luke 18. The blind man cries out, Son of David, have mercy on me. The term Son of David was directly pointing to the Messiah. Even though that points to the Messiah, the Jewish mindset in that day and even today was that the Messiah would be an earthly king. To see this point, we don't have to look any further than Matthew chapter 22. Go ahead and take a moment and flip over there with me. Matthew chapter 22, verse 41. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. He said to them, How is it then, speaking by the Spirit, that David calls him Lord? For he says, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one would say a word in reply, and from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Jesus quotes from Psalm 110, a psalm that they believe to be about the Messiah, and we're going to take a look at it real quickly, just for a minute. I'm going to read it to you. Psalm 110, verse 1, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at the right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will extend a mighty scepter from Zion, saying, Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your troops will be willing on your day of battle. Arrayed in holy splendor, your young men will come to you like the dew of the morning's womb. The Lord has sworn and he will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. I'm going to stop there just for a moment. A priest in the order of Melchizedek. Where do we see this? We see this in Hebrews chapter 4 at the end or the beginning of Hebrews chapter 5 if you want to look it up, specifically pertaining to Christ. Continue on in verse 5 of Psalms 110. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge nations, helping the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. He will drink from a brook along the way, so he will lift his head high. You see the section that I just read and the section that Jesus refers to in Matthew 22 specifically points to one thing. Jesus Christ was the Messiah, and that he came as deity. The correct answer here that the Jews missed is that the Messiah would be deity, and they did not understand it. They had an idea of what they thought the Messiah would look like, and they couldn't shake it. John Gill, a well-known 18th century theologian, had this to say, Had they understood and owned the proper divinity of the Messiah, 
they might have answered as that he was the Son of God. He was David's Lord, his Maker and King, and as a man was David's son. And so both his root and offspring. And this our Lord meant to bring them to either a confession of faith or to put them to confusion and silence, which ultimately was the consequence of that passage because they did not recognize him to be deity. It's also that way today amongst many Jews. You see, this is still the Jewish mindset regarding the Messiah. I did a lot of research looking at what do the Jews believe about the Messiah? Because they still believe that the Messiah is going to come. Here's what they write about the Messiah. The Messiah will be a great political leader descended from King David, as found in Jeremiah 23, 5. The Messiah is often referred to as the son of David. He will be well-versed in Jewish law and observant of its commandments. That's found in Isaiah 11, 2 through 5. He will be a charismatic leader, inspiring others to follow his example. He will be a great military leader who wins battles for Israel. He will be a great judge who makes righteous decisions, according to Jeremiah 33, 15. But above all, and here's where they miss it, he will be a human being. Not God, not a demigod, or other supernatural being. They conclude with this. It's been said in every generation, a person is born with the potential to be the Messiah. If the time is right in the, for the Messianic age, within that person's lifetime, then that person will be the Messiah. But if that person dies before he completes the mission of the Messiah, then that person is not the Messiah. This is the Jewish mindset. So there's a difference between calling out to the son of David and the son of God. The blind man called out to the son of David. Jesus then shows great mercy to the sinner in Zacchaeus, starting in Luke 19. Zacchaeus was a man who was hated for being a lying, cheating tax collector. He would have been looked down on the, in the community because of his job. But yet, this is a great story of grace in the life of a sinner. Jesus then tells the story of the ten minas. In this parable, we see a story of God's judgment. While they were listening to this, he went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem, and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. That's Luke 19.11. They thought the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. The teaching that Christ lays out here is that the kingdom of God was not going to be revealed in the way that they wanted it to be revealed. They were looking for redemption from earthly foes. He continues the parable. A man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed as king and then to return. Does this sound familiar? I'll read it again. A man of noble birth went to a district, distant country to have himself appointed as king and then to return. By the way, Jesus is seated on the throne as the king of king and kings and lord of lords. You can find it in Revelation chapter 19. So he called his ten of his servants and gave them ten minas. Put the money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him, and they sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. We see that the first man who had ten minas made ten more. Jesus said to him, well done, my good servant. His master replied, because you have been trustworthy in this small matter, take charge of ten cities. And the second one came. He was next. He was less useful, but yet equally diligent and active. His master answered, you take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, here is your mina. I have kept it in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take it out. You take out where you did not put in and reap where you did not sow. 
His master replied, I will judge you on your own words, you wicked servant. Skip down to verse 27. Jesus says, But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Sounds very harsh. This is not the Jesus that we sang about in Sunday school. Meek and mild. The one that we think of as, you know what? A big teddy bear that we can run up and, and hug and, and, and love and who, who, who loves everyone. There absolutely is a judgment coming. But we also need to remember that this story comes on the heels of Zacchaeus, which is a story of grace, a story of a Savior who brought salvation to one of the most hated men in Jericho. Jesus is bringing salvation to people like that all over the world today. He saves drug addicts, immoral liars, cheats, even killers. He took a life like Saul of Tarshish, a killer, one who persecuted the church and turned him into a man who by inspiration of the Holy Spirit wrote about half of the New Testament. He took fishermen, prostitutes, publicans, and tax collectors and turned them into followers. There's a great amount of grace as a gift from God. Without His grace, we as Christians would have no hope. That being said, there's another side to Jesus who will judge. If you continue reading in Revelation chapter 19, there will be a judgment. And if you don't find it there, continue reading in Revelation chapter 20. What we see here is that there is a judgment, but there's also grace and mercy. We're going to see those three aspects in our text today. Luke 19, 28. He sent two of the disciples telling them, Go into the village ahead of you. When you enter it, you will find a colt there that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent ahead found it exactly as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, the owners asked, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. Find it very interesting. When Israel asks for a king, go way back, Old Testament. When Israel asks for a king, where'd they find Saul? If anybody remembers, he was out looking for donkeys. But when Jesus, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, was looking for a donkey, he knew exactly where it was. He was able to tell them directly where to go and what to do to get that donkey. In fact, Jesus was greater than all the kings. He was greater than Saul because he knew exactly where the donkeys were. He's greater than David who was a man after God's own heart because Jesus was the God-man. Solomon, who built the temple. Jesus is the divine temple. Rehoboam, who did what was best in his own interest. Jesus Christ died on the cross, taking the form of a servant. We could go on and on down the line of kings. And Jesus was greater than each and every single one of them. Jesus tells his disciples exactly where to find the colt. He tells them, how, what to say to fetch it. You see, prophecy absolutely has to be fulfilled. In this text, Luke actually omits the fact that this is prophecy. But it's mentioned in both Matthew and John. The prophecy is found in Zechariah 9.9, 9, which says, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on, the, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. You see, it was absolutely destined for that moment in time. 
It was prophesied not only here that it was going to happen at this time, but in the book of Daniel. And prophecy absolutely has to be fulfilled. Jesus fulfilled every prophecy. Then they brought it to Jesus. They threw their cloaks on the colt, and Jesus got on it. As he rode along, they spread their cloaks along the road. I want you to think about this for a minute. Have you ever tried to ride an animal that had never been ridden before? Not only an animal that had never been ridden before, but a donkey. One of the most stubborn animals known to mankind. Yet Jesus is able to ride it with no problem. You see, the donkey was just falling in line with his creator. When the maker of the heavens and the earth sits on a donkey, the donkey says, what do you want? And I'm sorry to say it, but possibly one of the only living things that was fully falling under the master's submission at that point was that donkey. As he approached the road leading down from the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd and his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace and glory in the highest. They welcome him as a king. They throw down their robes before him. They even call him the son of David in Matthew's account. They shouted, Hosanna to the son of David, literally meaning, save us, son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. These are all things that they yelled. Luke says that they, that they shouted, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Mark added, Hosanna. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. They're quoting directly from a messianic psalm. Psalm 118. Psalm 118.25 says, Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The issue here is, they quoted a section of verses and they forgot to continue. When you look down at Psalm 118.27, it says, The Lord is God, and He has made His light to shine upon us. Last week I found it very, very interesting how this corresponds. We looked at John chapter 1, verse 4. It says, In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. We will be talking more about the light of the world in the, next, in the upcoming weeks. We will be continuing in our section from John. And we'll be talking about how Jesus was that light. But yet they forgot to continue that section where it says in verse 27 of Psalm 118, bind the festival sacrifice with cords to the horns up to the altar. The plan was and always had been pointing to Christ on the cross to bind up the festival sacrifice, and to take him to the altar. We might as well continue reading. In verse 28 it says, You are my God and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. It was absolutely love that sent Christ to the cross. We're going to skip back to Luke 19.39, where it says, But some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if they keep silent, the very stones will cry out. The prophecy, the prophecy that is found 
in the Old Testament was going to be fulfilled one way or another. If creation itself had to testify, it would have been done. Matthew chapter 3, 7 through 10. It says, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the tree, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. And I'm going to tell you what. God absolutely did raise up children from Abraham. When you look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 7, it says, Understand then that those who have faith, faith in what? Faith that Jesus is the Son of God and that he came and died on the cross for their sins. Understand that they are children of Abraham. Again in Luke 19, as he approached the city in Jerusalem, he wept. Literally means to convulse. He was convulsing. He was weeping over the city. Why was he weeping? If you had only known on this day what would bring you peace. If you had only known on this day what would bring you peace. That's what he says. But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. They did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. They did not see it. I like thunderstorms. <laughs> Since they didn't recognize the time that was coming, that God came to them, Jesus wept. And he wept for a reason. He wanted them to understand why he came. And ultimately, I believe that there probably was some in the crowd that might have understood eventually why he came. But this was a superficial celebration on the part of the people who were expecting an earthly king, but yet God used it for his plan and for his glory. You see the passage that we just read in Luke chapter 19. Jesus prophesied. He said, They will come upon you when your enemies build an embankment around you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another. When the temple in Jerusalem was just destroyed, this prophecy was fulfilled. So what can we learn from today? Point number one. Things aren't always as they seem. You see, it seems like the people that are there saying Hosanna. Literally meaning save us. Save us now. Can look like a great thing. But yet when he goes to the cross, they have no idea what to do. Sometimes when we think that things are going great, it may not be as it seems. And sometimes when we think that the worst thing in the world has just happened, it may be a blessing. See, Jesus knew what he was destined for. He was destined for the cross. He was destined for this time. 
at the time when the disciples saw that Jesus was on the cross and that he was being crucified. They ran. They hid. It would seem like it was the worst thing that could have ever happened to them at that point. I don't know what struggles you guys are going through today in the crowd. I have no idea what you guys are struggling with. But let me tell you this. There's sometimes when things seem like they're going really, really good, and they're absolutely not. And there's times when you may be having the worst day or worst time of your life, and God will use it for his glory. Point number two. The creation itself in this story is submitted to the Lord. What do you want from me? Let's go. Jesus jumps on. Donkey says, okay. Let's go. Are you submitted to the Lord? Point number three. There have always been haters and followers of Christ. In the story, we see people that are saying Hosanna to the Messiah. Did any of them truly understand what was going to happen? I don't believe so. But there were some that followed him. And in the end, they continued to follow him. There have always been followers, some as admirers, and some truly in a relationship with Christ. So the question has to be asked, do you believe in Jesus solely as a good man? Maybe a role model? Maybe he's a prophet? Do you see him just solely as the son of David? Or do you believe and see him as the son of God? You see, there's going to be another triumphal entry. The real triumphal entry. It's found in Revelation chapter 21. Jesus will come and he will reign. Revelation 21, and I heard in a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God is dwelling, God's dwelling place is among the people. And he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and no more death, mourning, crying, or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He will come, and he will reign as the Son of God. The question is, is do you see him? as the Son of God. As we transition back into the book of John in the upcoming weeks, there's a specific verse that I want you guys to be thinking about. Throughout the whole time that we look at the book of John, John wrote his book for one purpose, and he tells us why he wrote his book. You can find it in John 20, 31. It says, But these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you have life in his name. That is the purpose of the whole book of John. That you may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that you have life in his name. Everything in John points to that. You can view him as the son of David. You can view him as solely a man. Or you can view him as the son of God who came to this world to save you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for today.
I thank you for your sacrifice. I thank you for coming as the Son of God so that those who believe in you can experience your grace. God, I pray over this next week as we think about the sacrifice that you made for us on the cross, God. I pray that you would give us boldness and that we would be able to share your life with someone else this week. God, help us to make disciples. Help us to show them who you truly are and that you are the Son of God. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. If you guys will rise for the benediction. I was just signaled that I forgot to make an announcement. I forgot to make an announcement that next week, it forgot to get put in the bulletin, that we will be having a time for the kids at 9.30, and that will include an Easter egg hunt. So if you're interested in that, and I forgot one part of it. And a lesson. And a lesson. There will be a lesson at 9.30. Uh, in which room? In the chapel. So we're going to be having a lesson in the chapel at 9.30 and an Easter egg hunt. At 9.30, if you want to come here, come join us. We'd love to see you. For the benediction. I'm going to end today with something that I want you guys to think about over the whole time that we're in the book of John, which is the verse that I just read. John 20, 31. But these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you have life in his name. Praise be to the Lord forever and ever. Amen and amen. Have a great week.